Thank you for joining us. It's overtime. It's Monday night. Thank you for being here. I'm Dan Burrell, your host with me for the second straight week. Third time this year is Icy Vic, co-host of The Huddle Show, which can be seen here tomorrow night at 5 o'clock on Rock Sports Network. Thank you so much, Icy. It's a pleasure having you on. It's a pleasure to be on. Second week in a row. So, it's, of course, today's show is brought to you by Thurman Thomas's 34 Rush of Batavia Downs, where things are hopping every night with over 30 HD screens, including a 15-foot main screen, food and drink specials, and live music on select weekends. Be sure to check out Facebook.com slash Batavia Downs for more information on special events and promotions. Icy's going to tell you about a new church that's coming. I don't know if you've heard of it. The Church of Josh Allen. They were singing his praises yesterday. And, of course, there were the detractors that were protesting as well. But the Bills go in, and they handle Miami fairly well yesterday down in South Beach. Tremaine Edmonds gives an impassioned speech before the game the night before. Of course, Josh Allen lights it up. There were a couple of special team snafus, but all in all, probably the best game you've seen the Bills offense put up this year. And now all of a sudden, people want to say, see, see, I told you how great Josh Allen is. (laughs) And, uh, well, let me ask you, Icy, what are your thoughts on the church of Josh Allen, which you brought up? Before the show, I mean, they should go back to their holes right now for for a few minutes. What it comes down <laughs> to is that these guys were nowhere to be found all season <laughs> long, right? Last week they get beat by Cleveland, mm-hmm. and which is the second lowest team in the NFL, right. by the way, our scoring team in the NFL, by the way. And then they come against Miami, the team that they all said was the worst team in the NFL, a team that's tanking, and they beat them like they should, and all of a sudden. He's the heir apparent. He's uh, the second coming. The rapture is here. <laughs> you know? So it just, it, it can't, it's kind of mind blowing. Did you put him in the Wall of Fame yet or what? I is mean, number 17 been retired? We, we could. We <laughs> could. After, after last game, you know, the, all the points they put up, it was fantastic. I love to see it. Love to see that the Bills were able to move the ball and score some points. But in the same sense, I mean, it's. Miami, right, right, right. Yeah, they, they are the Dolphins. Yeah, they did. They have won two straight, and they are getting better, or were getting better, but they are still the Dolphins, and they're not the very, Dolphins. very good right now. But I'll say this: a win is a win. Got to say that. Absolutely. Okay. I've been critical of this team throughout the season, as you've seen on this show, saying when are the Bills going to go out and dominate a team from start to finish? Well, they've done it now three times. They've done it against the Giants. They've done it against Washington. Now they've done it against Miami. Now it's the second time they played the Dolphins. First time they played them after a bye week, and that didn't go so well. And they were this close to almost losing that if it weren't for a Trey White interception and a 99-yard drive that ensued. But you win the games you play. The Bills are 7-3 and three now, and they control their own destiny. But looking at this game as a whole, what was your biggest takeaway uh, from yesterday's game? I thought it was the fact that Josh Allen played a clean game from start to finish, didn't turn the ball over, didn't, ca- didn't cough up the football. I know Devin Singletary did at one point. But he played a complete game, and he had his offensive quarterback up in the box. I don't know how much that means. I mean, I never see Bill Belichick's guys up in the box either. I don't know if that means really anything significant. I know you could see more from upstairs, but I mean, what was your biggest takeaway going from coming from yesterday's game? Well, you can you got to see how effective this offense can be when Josh Allen hits guys in stride. Think about it. On the two touchdown passes, the one to um, John Brown, Brown and the other one to Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox. Both those balls were perfect balls. Balls were they caught the ball NFL throws. in strike mm-hmm. in stride both NFL throws and the, the John Brown one just the arm strength involved to get the ball there that fast where the safety couldn't react is why you drafted him right but because he threw the ball in front of him where he was able to catch and run with the ball it makes a move gets in the end zone same thing with Dawson Knox cut gets him in stride he's able to break a tackle and get in the end zone where a lot of those throws that you see him make over the course of the season. John Brown has to stop, wait for it, catch it. Safety's there. Dawson Knox, the ball's here. Instead of out in front, he's getting tackled there because he can't take the ball and, r- and run with it. Uh, we, Ryan and I talked about this last week, things that they need to do to get Josh Allen going. And slant routes have been his bread and butter. He's been killing the slant routes. That's one read, lock on the guy, throw it out in front of him. He's got the arm strength to get it there through in tight windows. And up the seam, something they haven't utilized much all season long. It's the same same thing as a a slant route. It's going up the seam. It's kind of like a skinny slant, throwing the ball up the seam, and he can get get guys that in stride. That's what his strong suit was back when we were evaluating in the pro days and back when he was in the senior bowl. We knew that's what he can excel at, and that's what they did this week. 
and the, you saw what they did. They you were see, able to move the ball and produce. The John Brown throw was cool, too, because he went through his progressions before he delivered the football. He yeah. went one, here, here, and then he delivered the football, and that shows that he is making progress. Now, we got to remember a few things, and I'm not just making anything up for Josh Allen. We've both been critical of Josh Allen, constructively critical. He yeah. can play in the NFL, and he's proven that. Whether it's as a backup or as a starter the rest of his career still remains to be seen. The jury's still out, and yes, they just beat the Dolphins, but we'll take the victory if you're a Bills fan. But looking at this as a whole, he did come out of my Wyoming. Not exactly a, a, a college football powerhouse, not exactly a well-coached team. He stepped in the second half of the first game of the season last year, had his issues, got hurt at Houston, came back, and all of a sudden has like pieced his way into playing good football for the Buffalo Bills. He was labeled a project. J.P. Lossman was also labeled a project. Some considered E.J. Manuel a project. And those last two projects that I mentioned never really materialized. You're, when, you, when you look at those two in their careers, and you see Josh Allen, you're not seeing the same kinds of mistakes. You're seeing a quarterback that is looking at slight getting better game by game and it's not going to happen overnight you're not going to see that leap from year one to year two with him that's to be expected but we did have a good game from him yesterday now can he continue that against the Denver Broncos because I still consider the Broncos game a must win game Absolutely. for a team that's you know trying to control its own destiny Ryan Lacell had a tweet out today he and hashtag sports were talking about it Mario from the uh, Brockport uh, broadcasts saying, look, if your team is continuing to win football games by controlling its own destiny and not needing help to get to the playoffs, you can call it a successful season. So, so far, regardless of the schedule, the Buffalo Bills have had a successful season. But you do not want to leave this season in the hands of other AFC games and other AFC teams and opponents. You have to beat Denver because it's not looking like it's based on the track record. Dallas is going to be a tough team to beat on Thanksgiving. That game is Absolutely. coming up relatively quickly. So you saw a Denver team yesterday have a first-half lead that they squandered against the Minnesota Vikings. I've always had a theory. I don't know about you, I see. But in the second half of games, when a team doesn't do squat in the second half of games, it, there's usually a carryover. And i got to wonder if there's going to be a carryover from this Denver Broncos team, which has played good football. They just haven't had any offense. If that Correct. carryover is going to continue, they got to come back across the country and play the Bills on Sunday. I want to see the same kind of game, and, of course, we all do, but I really mean it. I want to see the same kind of game against the Denver Broncos, but it's going to be a tougher challenge. Definitely will on Sunday. No, the, offensively it's going to be tougher because that defense, the Denver Broncos defense, is actually a very good defense. Right. Offensively, um, they have to do the same type of things, get Josh Allen, uh, Josh Allen in rhythm, easy throws, throws where he's getting guys open, not making them make mistakes or forcing them into the situations where he's going to make mistakes. Defensively, you can do what you did against the Miami Dolphins because they don't have anybody there. No. They they don't really have anybody. You send the house, send some extra blitzes, get a quarterback scramble, uh, get a quarterback flustered, and force mistakes. They didn't force a lot of mistakes last week, but this is a, a Denver Broncos team that's not playing very well this whole season as a, an entirety. So. They're about, a, they're about a 500 team. They've had a few missed yeah. field goals, a couple of bad penalties at the end of games. I mean, they lost to Chicago early in the season yeah. thanks to a, an unsportsmanlike conduct penalty that, like, snowballed into a loss. But, I mean, they, they are a good football team. It's going to be Allen on Allen yeah. Sunday. That's going to be interesting. But I think that <laughs> I mean I think that the Bills have to come away with a victory. I hate putting must-win games in the middle of November with a team that's 7-3 and three right now. But you, ha you have to go ahead and win this game because you're looking ahead. you got Denver, yep. of course, and then the rest of your schedule. You have Baltimore coming to town. Yep. you got to go to Pittsburgh. you got to go to Foxborough for that Saturday game at yep. 430. And you finish the season with the Jets at home. And we saw what happened last year when the Jets played the Bills at home as well. Jets are starting to build a little bit of momentum too. I don't like using that word momentum because it really doesn't predict anything. Thing, but it's showing you that they're starting to play good football again now that Sam Darnold's starting to get his bearings and maybe things are calm a little bit with the Jets. But you got to go out and win this game first. I Absolutely. think it's a must win game. And you got a quick turnaround. You got Dallas that Thursday. Right. Four days later. So yeah. if you if you came, come out flat, how do you expect to get any kind of momentum going to Dallas at Dallas on the road with a short turnaround? in a good team in their stadium. It's going to be dope. Last time the Bills won in Dallas, I think, was the year after they lost the first Super Bowl to the Cowboys. I think it was that um – I think it was a game where, I think, not Ronald Darby, Matt Darby had an interception late, and they sealed the game against Jimmy Johnson. Emmett Smith was out. Remember, he was holding out for his contract. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, we saw what happened. They became the first team that went 0-2 and won the Super Bowl, uh, the Dallas Cowboys that year. But it's been a while since the Bills have won in Dallas, and, you know, history does have a way of repeating itself. So, But one more thing on Josh Allen. The 300-game the 300 game narrative. He's not a bowler. Okay, he's a, he's a quarterback. 
and everybody wants to see him throw for 300 yards. I mean, you saw Fitzpatrick do it yesterday. Kirk Cousins did it mostly in the second half. Guys still throw for 300 yards all the time. You haven't seen it yet, but to me, that's not indicative of success. To me, it's just controlling the game and winning the game, you know, and being the reason why you won the game. 300 yards to me is irrelevant. How about you? It's irrelevant, but in the same sense, when when you look at 300 yards as a measuring stick and you're saying guys have to be able to throw the football. This is NFL in 2019. This is not oh, just you can just run the ball all game long. The rules are oriented to throw the ball, right? You have to be able to throw the ball when you need to throw the ball. In a game like yesterday's game, there was a couple spots where Josh Allen just terribly missed his guys. Throw a few, yes. You know, and low throws, low throws behind out of throws. Line. Right. And if he completes those throws, guess what? That's a 300-yard game. And I don't, I'm not saying that it's necessary for success, but in a system where Josh Allen throws the ball, a, you know, a fair amount, mm-hmm. you know, a little, maybe a little below league average, especially in games when you're behind and you're throwing the ball, 300 yards means you're having success moving the ball. To have yardage means you're, you're a successful quarterback moving the ball downfield. You, you have to get yards to move downfield. So if you can do that through the air, that's all the better. It adds another dimension to your team. If you cannot move the ball for 300 yards to save your life, when it comes down time to it and you're playing a team that's putting up points, Ravens are leading the league in, uh, in, uh, in scoring this year. You're going to have to move the ball and put up points against them. If you can't do that through the air and you're behind and you can't do it when you're running because you're behind, when can you do it? Right. You have to be able to show you can do it. You have to make other teams afraid of you, in a sense, at, so they can't just load the box and say, beat me with your arm because we know you can't do it. The Eagles game was a great time to show, hey, it's uh, we're down. Let's let Josh Allen loose. And he didn't end up completing a ton of passes. And they didn't, he didn't get a 300-yard game, even right. in garbage time. Now, you're, you're a fan of pro football focus. They have the, uh, the yak yards, rack yards, run after catch. With these 300-yard games, I want to know, like, how much – I don't know if you've looked into it at all, but how much of it is it the run after the catch factor that contributes to these 300-yard games versus just air yards? Yeah. I mean, I mean is, is there, is there, is there a lot to that? There's definitely a lot to it. You see in these uh, high-powered offense – you know, Tyreek Hill, he's running under the ball and right. he's running in. But the fact of the matter is, you got to put your guys in position to do that. And Josh Allen hasn't been great at he doing that, done that yet. all season. Mm-hmm. Last game, it was the only exception where he could – he got the ball out there in front of guys where they were able to catch the ball and run. That's a part of being a good quarterback, putting guys in position to make plays, and you have to be able to do that. We're going to take a little break. This is Icy Vic. I'm Dan Burrell. This is Overtime right here on Rock Sports Network. We're brought to you by Ralph Honda, ranked number one in West New York for overall customer satisfaction. Come see how we do Honda right at Ralph Honda. See the 2020 Hondas arriving daily at Ralph Honda. It's that time of year, you guys. You want to get the lady a nice car, go to Ralph Honda, including the Odyssey, Pilot, Civic. A short drive to West Ridge Road at Elm Grove and online at Ralph Honda. Dot com. We come back. We played this game with Icy Vic before, back in October. We did a show at Bill Gray's, and that is Worst Things Worse. What was the worst thing that you saw this weekend? And, boy, we got a great start on Thursday night to give you a little hint of what we might be talking about. It's the Overtime Show. I'm Dan Barrell. This is Rock Sports Network. This is Icy Vic. Thank you for watching here on Facebook at rocksportsnet.com. Hi, my name is Henry, and I want to welcome you to Batavia Downs Gaming. We want you to love it, not just like it here. We went to our customers and asked them what we can do better. You said you wanted a hotel, so we built one. More and better food, we did that too. A separate place to smoke and play, we even did that. Batavia Downs Gaming and Hotel is the right size with the right people in the right location. Batavia Downs Gaming, come here to dine, stay, and play. Only $7.99 for a Bill Gray's Great Plate every Tuesday. Hi, I'm Zach Rowe. We've been selling cars for more than 80 years. We're family-owned, family-run, three generations strong. Come see the 2020 Hondas. There's something for every lifestyle. Whatever you're looking for in your next car, you'll find it at Ralph Honda. Daddy had surgery and his pain was put to ease. Let him more. Physical therapy. You're in overtime. I'm Dan Burrell. This is I.C. Vic, and he's from the Huddle Show, which can be heard or seen, he's using radio terms, seen tomorrow at 5 o'clock right here on Facebook at Rock Sports Net. Thank you so much for joining us. This segment brought to you by Lattimore Physical Therapy and Sports Rehab. Lattimore currently offers 25 clinics throughout Rochester, 
including nearby locations in Pittsburgh and Webster. More than 50 cer certified physical therapists have experience in treating most conditions and sports injuries and in most cases are able to offer initial consultations within 24 hours for your convenience. LattimorePT.com. It's time to play Worst Things Worst. But before we do, Mario Granada from Brockport fo does Brockport football here. Brockport, of course, making the postseason after winning the Empire A Conference. He chimed in and goes, Tom Brady had one 300-yard game in his first 18 games. Would you like to respond to your uh, your partner there, Mario Granada from Hatchet? Was that 2001? It's 2019. Shut your face. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> I mean, it's a different it's, game. It's, it's a different Vic, game, Karen right? Rock Sports Network. <laughs> it's a different game. It's apples and oranges. I, I still think like, like the 300-yard game doesn't mean as much to me. I think I would like to see him like get toward that, that, that goal somehow, but somehow this became a thing. But like as long as Allen somehow becomes the reason to win, where in the fourth quarter if you're down and you can put the ball in his hands and trust him to go through the two-minute drill and you have the confidence like we had for Jim Kelly that he can get the job done, I'm okay with that more than the yardage. The yeah. yardage could be nice too. I mean, J.P. lost at a couple 300-yard games. but Yeah, that's a beautiful deep ball. That's, that's why he could do that. Now, <laughs> let me ask you, they're down 14 points in the third quarter, fourth quarter. You think that he's going to be able to drive down and put 14 points up for you? I don't know yet. I don't think so. I don't think so either. I don't think so. If you throw the ball 40 times, 41 times in a game, and you can't hit th uh, 300 yards, that's not a huge, a, hu a big mark. 300 yards is not like some freaking 500, 600 yards passing. Guys, Cam Newton came out, who everyone says is not a great first quarterback. First game. First, first two four, games. 400 yards. 400 yards is first two games. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it's a, a mark that cannot be reached. 300 yards is not some astounding ac accomplishment. That's run-of-the-mill um, production for today's NFL. There's no reason why he can't, he can't get to that, especially in games where he's behind, and he's thrown a lot. I threw this idea at a uh, Buffalo radio guy, and he kind of like said it was pretty subjective. I'm like, yeah, no kidding. It is subjective. I'm going to throw this idea at you. There's five things I look for in a quarterback that if I think – if I have at least three of those, I have confidence that the quarterback can play the position. Okay. Number one, when your quarterback gets hurt and you see the backup warming up, do you get nervous? Okay. I don't know that I get nervous with Matt Barkley warming up just yet. I would rather have Allen out there, but I'm not getting nervous if, right. if Barkley's coming to the game. So that's one indicator. Second indicator, can he overcome a bad defensive game? We have yet to see Allen do that. The Philadelphia game was a perfect game to do that. He hasn't done that. I'm not picking on him. He won yesterday. I'm just giving facts here. Number three, can you overcome a bad offensive line? I think with his feet, he, he could, but he also takes a lot of sacks, and when he gets flushed out of the pocket, rolls to his right, problems seem to happen. You know, so those that's three indicators. Okay. Uh, there's also like, would you, if you're a playoff team, would you rather have your quarterback or the other team's quarterback? For all the playoff teams, you know, like Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen, I think I'd rather have Lamar Jackson right now. Yep. Tom Brady or Lamar or, or or Josh Allen, I think I'd rather have Tom Brady right now. So that's another indicator. And there's a fifth one that I have too that I can't remember off the top of my head. But right now, Josh Allen hasn't eclipsed. All, at least three of those yet. So right now, I still think he's a work in progress. I think he can definitely improve. Don't get me wrong. And the, four, and the last one, of course, is can you overcome a two-score deficit in the fourth quarter? Are you confident that you can overcome your quarterback can overcome a two-score deficit in the fourth quarter? And I don't know that Josh Allen could do that necessarily. He hasn't shown he could. Two score. That could be 10 points. That could be 11 points. It could be two touchdowns. But I, I haven't seen that from him. Now, that doesn't mean that that can't happen. But to me, if you could accomplish at least three of those five, to me, that means more to me than hitting a 300-yard game as, as part of some barometer because you could do that and still lose but let's move on to the worst things worst okay what was the worst thing you saw this week and i have four things to, to think of what do you um what do you think what are the some of the what was the worst thing you saw this week in the <laughs> sports and if you want to go back to thursday night you could do that now i'm going back to thursday night the worst <laughs> thing i saw <laughs> was a, a, a tiny quarterback going up against a, a you know, basically a chihuahua going up against a pit bull you know <laughs> you're, you're, you're looking at it and you're just like Mason Rudolph, what are you doing? <laughs> I understand it was a late hit. I understand your emotions were, but what are you doing? Miles Garrett will eat you. <laughs> and you know what? If, if, he if, if yeah, exactly, if he's not going to eat you, he's going to club you in the head with your own helmet. <laughs> Stop it, quarterbacks. Go back in your hole and ha hang out and hide. Let the, the, the big guys do your fighting for you. Right. Oh my goodness. Yeah, that was. Did you see some of the Facebook memes? I saw <laughs> one guy. Okay, so here's so here's one. Right. I, I don't know if you saw this. If you guys saw this at home. They showed a dude playing whack-a-mole. You know that game whack-a-mole, oh, right? Yeah. And they took a – it was Miles Garrett with a Pittsburgh Steelers helmet and Mason Rudolph's head popping up. And him <laughs> <hitting>. <laughs> I mean, Mason Rudolph deserved to be fine, too. And by the way, Mason Rudolph, all, all due respect, 
I mean, what shouldn't it shouldn't have happened? But you, number one, you try to take off Miles Garrett's helmet. Yeah. All right, that that doesn't excuse Miles Garrett for what he did. But number two, you can't sit there, challenge Miles Garrett, get hit in the head, and go, "Hey, where's the flag?" Yeah. <laughs> if that were Jim Kelly. <laughs> If that were Jim Kelly, Jim Kelly would have gotten right up in the dude's face. He wouldn't have time for the flag. He would have taken his helmet off and fought back. Yeah. All right. You, you can't. You can't be that guy. So right now, I think Mesa Rudolph lost <coughs> credibility there. I, I. I. don't blame Marquise Pouncey for what he did. Yes, he should be suspended. You can't be going kicking dudes and hitting dudes because that just kills order. You have to maintain order. But yeah. I understand. But Miles Garrett just like really like hurt his team. Hurt his team this year. He really did. And so, not that the, the Browns are going to go anywhere, but they are 4-6 and six at this point. Jeremy Sadak writes it on Facebook. He'd always write it on Facebook. <laughs> Rudolph is lucky for the helmet hit. I think Garrett's fist would have done more damage. Yeah, I know. And, I mean, fist to Fury, yes. He's a big dude. He is. He's, he's a, a big, big dude. dude. <laughs> he is a big dude. I don't want to mess with Miles Garrett. I, I wouldn't do that at all. I don't know if you saw this. So, here's the thing. Everybody praised Baker Mayfield for his comments after the game. Were you one of those people? No, I wasn't either. Now you now tell the audience why what you thought of ba- Baker Mayfield's comments to Aaron Andrews after the game because I I might have a different thought. Well, I mean, Baker Mayfield is just trying to save face. It seems like he's just posturing, saying what people th- what he thinks people want Baker want Ma- him to say exactly. so he Baker can Mayfield's put himself over. Been historically an a hole, right? Yeah, I mean. No, start to finish, mm-hmm. college the whole through, and a lot of people didn't like to. He's do always got to tell you how good he is, right? That's my issue with Baker. And his parents always got to tell you how good Baker is, too. Did you watch that Fox Sports 1 special on him when he was getting drafted? I did not see that. Oh, my goodness. It's like, Baker, 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 Baker. A good parent would have uh, – not that they're good, not good parents. Let me say that. A smart parent would have said, maybe we should put the reality show on hold for a bit and see what happens. But no, no, we got to talk about Baker. Baker wouldn't let anybody put Baker down. Baker fought his way through things. And he got to <laughs> Oklahoma, and guess what? He won the highs because Baker – you know, Baker works hard. Yeah, no kidding. He's the number one overall draft pick. We understand. He's a Heisman Trophy winner. He's got to be pretty good at something. Well, for crying out loud, Baker's always telling me about how good Baker is, and he threw his own teammate under a bus before he even saw a replay of what happened. And here's the worst part. He doesn't have a public relations official in his ear telling him, hey, you know what? I didn't see it. I think I know what happened. I want to talk to Miles before I comment on that. That was what a leader should say instead of saying, <laughs> it's reprehensible, it's deplorable. Yeah, well, no kidding. Don't throw another log on that fire. That's where I got a problem. And all these people are praising Baker's maturity, and I'm like, why? So you can win <laughs> points with him because he's on television? To me, Baker was just he was just as immature in that statement. Yeah, I agree. So uh, another thing I couldn't stand this weekend, did you see the two attack below a hit? I did. Oh, my goodness. Now, I, look, when I saw the hit, I didn't see what led to the hip dislocation. But my heart went out because immediately people were using the words Bo Jackson to describe oh, it. Oh, yeah. And you and I are both old enough to remember that game where Bo, you know, like he, not only the end of his football career, his baseball career was never the same no, after that. it was not. But the funny, the funniest comment I saw after it, you know, they said it's a Bo Jackson injury. And someone commented, Bo knows hip displacement. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Oh. That is spot on. But, right. yeah, you no. Know, all joking aside, it's sad to see. This is an extremely talented kid, and you don't want to see anybody lose out because of injuries, especially injury injury that that's gruesome. You know, you see guys with different things breaking their legs and stuff. Uh, Johnny Knox when his career ended, yep. when he got bent backwards. No one wants to see that. Well, Michael thing, Bush was supposed to be the first overall pick in the NFL draft. He tore his ACL at Louisville, and he was never the same. Never yep. the same. Never the same. That happens. Uh, who was the kid at the Pro Bowl? Robert Edwards, who played for the Patriots. Uh, he was supposed to be the next Curtis Martin. Oh yeah, yeah. And he, yeah. And he was playing beach football. It can happen. But here's my point, though. It could happen anywhere. A lot anywhere. of people were killing Nick Saban for not pulling uh, Tua out of that game. They were running the two-minute drill. They had just lost the week before to LSU. He had been hurt. He, they, it, Saban wanted him to get reps, and it was the last you know uh, minute of the first half, and he ends up getting hurt. What, what is Saban supposed to do? Well, you're up four touchdowns. I'm like, you still got to get some work in. Yeah. These guys don't want to be pulled out anyway. No, Tua didn't want to get pulled no, out. Why, why would they want to be pulled out? These guys don't play for fear of injury. Right. Uh, unless they're – this is the NFL and their contracts are online. That's one thing. But in college, that's their moneymaker. Their stats, their status is their moneymaker. You want to get drafted high, you need to put stuff on film. They have to put stuff on film. It doesn't matter if they're up four touchdowns or four points. Right. You have to put stuff on film to get drafted. And you know what a lot of people see? They only see the numbers. 
You know, they don't watch every game. They, you know, they might watch the game here and there, but this guy has produced this. this they guy box has, score scout. Yeah, got it. Not everybody got all the time that you have to, like, you know, sit in your house and, like, watch all the film and break right. it all down. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have the access to do that. You have the all 22. I don't have that, but you are, a lot of people are able to do that. Not everybody's able to do that. And when guys are looking at the, at the numbers and they're voting for the highs and everything else, they look at two attack of a low and go, yeah, wow, this guy's amazing. Not to mention, you know, Nick Saban, the one thing about Alabama is that their offensive line is so good that their running backs and quarterbacks who win Heismans are awesome in college, but they get to the NFL. And they're not the same. No. Shell well, of themselves. Yeah, when was the last time an Alabama quarterback was awesome? you got to go back to Joe Namath and Ken Stabler. So I think Nick Saban's trying to prove, hey, I have a guy who's going to be the number one overall pick in the NFL, and he's a quarterback of mine, and I need to get him some reps. So when I show up at the draft, I show, yeah, I also produced a Heisman-winning number one overall quarterback. Because yeah. he's seeing what's happening with Jalen Hurts right now, his old quarterback in Oklahoma. And all of a sudden, Lincoln Riley is making Jalen Hurts look like a draft pick. Like He wasn't even considered to be a draft pick right. a year ago let alone the first round, and all of a sudden Lincoln Riley's making Jalen Hurst look like a Heisman candidate. So now you gotta go to, you're going to Saban going, well, Saban, you won national championship, but you haven't, proved, you haven't put out a quarterback yet. So now here he has. He's got a chance with Tua. They're playing football. It's going to happen. Injuries are going to happen. It was just a freak thing. Yeah, like Bo Jackson injury. It now, was a freak thing. Right. Now here's, here's the other thing. They, they also say that Bo Jackson, his, own, his injury was kind of his fault because he was so powerful that he actually he pulled, his own pulled it out his own hip. <laughs> The vascular necrosis, I think, was the diagnosis, if I remember correctly. But here's the interesting thing, though. Somebody brought this up, that this may actually be a blessing in disguise for Tua Tagovailoa. And the reason is because they think that if you're looking at the teams that are going to draft at the top of the draft, the Cincinnati Bengals are right there at 0-10. Yeah. And if you notice that Sean McVay's really losing steam and stock, especially last night with the Bears, I mean, they won, but he doesn't have a second act. We'll get into that in the next segment. And you saw these, co these coaches get – hired because they were pals with Sean McVay or they've incorporated ideas of Sean McVay's offenses into you know their, their coaching capabilities so this kid gets hired this Taylor Zach Taylor gets hired by the Cincinnati Bengals the Bengals have looked lost all season they're 0-10 do you really want if you're to attack Valoa do you really want to go to Cincinnati and play for a guy who's like so far removed from a guy who now may not be the genius everybody thinks he is or do you want to, and like Colin Coward brought this up today, or is it better to, like, you know, fall back a few spots and maybe land in a team like Atlanta that has a stable front office who you could sit behind Matt Ryan for a year, maybe, get healthy, and then go out and be ready to play when they're ready to go? I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. And I'm like, when he first said this, I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, you know what? It's not, the, it's not the worst thing in the world right now. I mean, I, I don't want him to – I hope he's, he's going to be okay and be able to come back next year and play if this injury isn't a Bo Jackson-type injury. But they say if he has the surgery and he, and he gets ready in rehab, he should be able to go to the combine, should be able to compete. But I'll tell you what, is it, is it the worst thing in the world? It's not the worst thing in the world because, like you said, it, I don't think his draft stock's going to drop that much anyway. I think you know, that's one that's of what Trent things. Dilfer said today. Yeah, the, the people are talking about it. Is, is his stock going to drop? And this, that, and the third. I honestly don't think he's going to drop much. Today is not like in 2001, where you can have a shoulder injury and be just not the same. You know, um, Drew Brees was one of the first guys who had reconstructed surgery mm -hmm. and came out fine. And now that they have this technology where guys aren't going to suffer the same injuries and be out and for extended periods of time and n not be the same. Of course, there's always the, the odd injury where people get hurt and there's something gruesome that happens where they're, n they're never going to be the same. But I don't, th 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 by all intents and purposes, this doesn't seem like it's going to be that kind of an injury. And if it's not going to be that kind of injury, he passes the physicals and everything. They know what he can do as a quarterback. There's, he's still going to be the top of a lot of people's draft boards. So you got the kid, for, you got Justin Herbert at Oregon. Uh, I, I'm not certain on him. Just yet. I mean, I like him a lot. You got a uh, Joe Burrow came out of nowhere. Yeah. Okay. You also got, you know, the people are talking about um, the kid out of Georgia. Uh, is it Jake Fromm? And then uh, is, it, is it Jake Fromm? I, I haven't watched yeah, much Fromm, college football. Yeah, yeah and I, haven't, I haven't watched a heck of a lot of college football this year. I've been busy at Fisher or Brockport. And then, of course, going into the following year, you got, you know, uh, Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields. Again, I'm not sold on – Ohio State quarterbacks. I look at them the same way as I look at Alabama quarterbacks. Right, yeah. Too. But I, I still think that, you know, people are going to – somebody's going to take a chance on Tua Tagovailoa. The, the only thing about Tua, though, it's not the first time he's been hurt. You right. know, he was hurt last year. He was banged up. And uh, he was banged up a bit this year. He fought 
you know, heaven and earth to come back and play against LSU, and he put up a pretty good game. And I wonder if, like, people may put the injury-prone label on him. But if he drops to a good team that just had a bad year this year in the NFL draft, that might be the best thing for him looking, looking long-term. Uh, another thing that happened over the weekend, uh, I know you, you're a big film guy. Did you watch the Colin Kaepernick um the workout fiasco <laughs> went on Saturday. No, I didn't. I didn't get a chance to see the the workout. Was it, was it televised? <laughs> it was, I guess it was on YouTube. Like I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I'm at the Fisher no. game, and I'm like, whoa, it's what, what happened? I thought it, you know, it got canceled, and then I read a little bit more. Oh, it's yeah, been moved, moved to a yep. local high school. Mm-hmm. Okay, and um, what what was your take on Colin Kaepernick this weekend? That whole the, from start to finish. I mean, I don't understand it at all. Everyone knows what Colin, Colin Kaepernick can do. They've seen. There's plenty of film on him. I guess they're sitting here saying, man, maybe he can be, you know, um, a, a decent quarterback going forward. We see, we got to see if he still has it, but he's still a young guy. You're not worried about the age factor. He's not like a 40-year-old guy coming back and saying, I still got it. Uh, and I just don't understand what, what it's doing us. What I thought was interesting out of this whole situation is that they um, – Adam Schefter says, oh, the Bills were one of the teams in attendance. One of the eight teams that yeah. showed up. And Bills were like, nope, wasn't me. <laughs> nah. <laughs> like Shaggy, wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It, it's just like, listen, some of these teams don't want to be attached to any part of Colin Kaepernick. I don't blame them. And uh, later on, the people talked about it after they were like, well, I don't think there's any chance anyone signs them because they've had plenty of time to sign them. They didn't need a workout and say, well, we need to sign this guy. That there's a lot of teams that are worse off at quarterback than what Colin Kaepernick can bring to the table, but they still don't sign him because he costs the NFL millions of dollars. So, so, so the theory is that the NFL provided cover, excuse me, for teams that wanted to give him a workout but didn't want it out in their fan bases that they were going to do that. So the NFL decided here's going to be the day. It's going to be on a Saturday. It's going to be sanctioned by the NFL and everything else be here at this time I thought that was kind of unfair I also thought it was unfair for Kaepernick to pull the bait and switch instead of playing by the NFL rule, NFL's rules and say I really want to play and I'm going to play by your rules and we're going to give you a workout LeVar, LeVar Arrington said today on FS1 that was not a typical quarterback workout he didn't go through all the things quarterbacks do in a workout on a Tuesday when they're trying <laughs> players out he was just simply running around throwing the ball he didn't do play action he wasn't doing seven on seven drills and then he wears a Kunta Kinte shirt to the to the workout and then afterwards makes a two-minute statement about everything he supposedly stands for doesn't take questions does this was just a big media circus and a lot of his supporters in media ex-players everybody else alike like the Fritz Pollard Alliance and Shannon Sharp and Stephen A. Smith they're like no no sorry you're, you're not serious about this. this is all about you yeah this isn't about any type of social justice this is all about you so Colin Kaepernick we may have seen his last game uh, in an NFL uniform so we're gonna take a little break we're gonna come back we used to do I used to do this on my show with Scott Petoniak on ESPN Rochester 10 NFL questions I'm gonna ask I see 10 NFL questions real quick rapid fire we're gonna go through them and of course at the end of the show overtime rules this segment of course brought to you by Bob Johnson Chevrolet Bob Johnson's goal is to give you the best deal on the best newer used vehicle possible if you're not sure what you're looking for in a new truck car or SUV stop by and talk with their expert sales team and they'll help you figure out which model fits your needs or requirements best. Bob Johnson, Chevrolet, Ridge Road, and Greece. This is Icy Vic from The Huddle. I'm Dan Barello, and this is Overtime on Rock Sports Network. If you're living with pain or recovering from surgery and don't know where to start, Lattimore Physical Therapy can help. The Lattimore Promise includes an individual diagnosis with a highly trained licensed physical therapist on your first visit, a personalized treatment plan, communication with your doctor, and a continued personal care plan. You're never more than minutes away from pain relief. Visit LattimorePT.com. Lattimore Physical Therapy. You'll get more for your money. You'll get much greater value. You talk to kind, courteous people who really care. They're so sincere. I recommend them to my family. I recommend them to Only $7.99 for a Bill Gray's Great Plate every Tuesday. 
Hi, I'm Steve Ralph. We've been selling cars for more than 80 years. Our best values are available right now at Ralph Honda. Come see the 2020 Hondas. There's something for every lifestyle. Whatever you're looking for in your next car, you'll find it at Ralph Honda. You're in overtime. This is Icy Vic from the Huddle. Heard Tuesday, oh, seen Tuesday nights right here on Rock Sports Network at 5 o'clock. He and Ryan Lacell will take you to the Buffalo Bills, their big win over Miami, which we recapped in the first segment, and looking ahead to the Denver Broncos and perhaps even the Dallas Cowboys with the quick week with Thanksgiving. Of course, this is brought to you by Bill Gray's Restaurant and Tap Room. For those of you living and watching in Buffalo, you got to get the Bill Gray's when you come out here. Every Tuesday is Great Plate Tuesday at Bill Gray's. To seven ninety nine, two Bill Gray's cheeseburgers on top of home fries and max salad. I'm sure you can get it with hot dogs the way I like it too, with cheese. Well, with your favorite, with your choice of toppings, including Bill Gray's famous meat hot sauce. Great plate Tuesday every Tuesday. Gimme, 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 Bill Gray's. It's time for ten NFL questions. Rapid fire. I'm gonna ask my friend Icy here ten different NFL questions. Get his opinion. Number one: Are the Patriots over as we know them, Icy? After yesterday's Oh, abysmal game. They won and beat the Philadelphia Eagles. Are they over as we know them? No. I think Bill Belichick makes adjustments, as he always does, and finds a way to win. And, you know, they're going to probably we, – we talk about this every year, like last few yeah, – Every year years. about this time. Is it no, over? Is it over? Is it over? Nope. I think Bill Belichick is the greatest head coach slash GM ever to live. They'll be fine. He'll ride the river until he finds that branch, and then he'll climb out of the river and find a way to do it. I agree with Icy. I said in the first – month of this season during this show my overtime rules i will believe tom brady is done with the nfl and the patriots are done when you pull that ball out of his cold dead hands number two we alluded to this last segment does rams head coach sean mcveigh have a second act i think that the again he will make the necessary adjustments he's got a, a quarterback that's inconsistent Gurley's up and down with injuries he's not the same you got henderson not playing well behind him as a guy that you drafted to be the heir apparent so I, I think that as this team grows and as a, the quarterback position grows, the running backs get better, get healthy, that this team's going to get back up to where they belong. The defense is still the defense. They still got a lot of big names there. I think they'll be fine. My only thing with Sean McVay, though, is that like during the Super Bowl last year, he failed to adjust to the Patriots in the second half, even though it was a close game. He's not a great in-game coach as far as adjustments, and he's starting to go back to like punting on fourth and one and doing things that last year's Sean McVay and the year before Sean McVay didn't do. So you got to wonder where his head's at. But hey, look, if you're going to give him a genius label after two years, you got to give him a little bit more time to figure things out in L.A., particularly with his quarterback, Jared Goff. Ten NFL questions. Number three, who will be coaching the Dallas Cowboys next season the Cowboys yeah they beat the Detroit Lions yesterday but Detroit gave them a heck of a game with not just one backup quarterback but two Bo Scarborough are you freaking kidding me I mean Bo Scarborough was a a big name in Dallas you know prior (laughs) to the the beginning of the season he was on my sleeper watch for fantasy (laughs) no I I, next year if uh if you're gonna go move on how about a name that um was a perpetual playoff contender you know and that's uh, Marvin Lewis He's sitting out there, readily available, and he got canned despite making the playoffs like six out of eight years. That's a great point. And I, I've always thought that Marvin Lewis might even be a better general manager because yeah. he could pick talent. I mean, he was the guy buying the groceries in Cincinnati. Yeah. Uh, now, would he be able to work with Jerry Jones? Because Jerry Jones likes to be the guy buying the groceries. And he does a pretty good job of it. There's talent on that team, but he's got his – Jerry's biggest problem is Jerry yeah. because Jason Garrett – I mean, let's be honest – Jason Garrett gets fired. I can only see him coaching one NFL team next year, Cleveland. Why? Because he's a yes man. John Dorsey wants that <laughs> in a head coach. But so does Jerry Jones. I could see North Turner coaching that team. But Lincoln Riley seems to be the hot name. Yeah. You know? So, as Jimmy Johnson once said, who's going to coach the Cowboys? Whoever Jerry wants. So, um, but I don't think it's going to be I don't think it's going to be Jason Garrett no. next year. I don't think it's going to be him. Uh, Ten NFL questions. Number four. Would you rather have Deshaun Watson or Lamar Jackson? One had an awful game yesterday. One had a great game yesterday. I'd still have Deshaun Watson. How about you? Deshaun Watson. Lamar Jackson is much improved this year than last year. I was a huge detractor for him. Um, but Deshaun Watson is a better quarterback, and he still has the mobility. You could probably run that same system with Deshaun Watson that they're running in um, in Baltimore, but 
be a more efficient at the pa- with the passing game. So I, I would definitely go with uh, Deshaun Watson. Lamar Jackson does have streaks or skids, yeah. you know, throughout games if you watch him from start to finish. But he's able to make up for it with his feet. But I have yet to see an NFL quarterback continue to play the rest of his career with his feet. I know that Greg Roman, former Bills offensive coordinator, is doing great things with Lamar Jackson. But I think they're playing for this year. I don't think we're going to be seeing a lot of this stuff next year. Russell Wilson, if there was one guy who could continue to do that, it would be Russell Wilson. Russell Wilson doesn't do that stuff anymore no. either. So, I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's great for him now, Lamar Jackson. I still think I would rather have at this point Deshaun Watson. Deshaun Watson had a bad game yesterday, had no offensive line help. And it looks like the Texans, who, despite their bad offensive line, they've let Chantrell Le- Le- Henderson walk. Yeah. The Bills are going to be without Ty Secchi probably for the rest of the season. you got to wonder if the Bills, I know a lot of Bills fans say this because they know him, if they're going to give Chantrell Henderson another look. Yeah, might as well. Instead of Ryan Bates. Number five, are the Niners really the class of the NFC, I see? Yeah, they are. Okay. Why not? they got a great defense. they got a steady offense. And they're just mollywhopping people. They're beating people. Like it's, n- it's their job just to go out there and, and dominate. I, I, I like the, the San Francisco 49ers. I like their recipe. They built that front up the defensive front, and they're playing hard-nosed football. I love to see it. Jimmy Garoppolo still, though, makes mistakes often in games. They were down yesterday. They did have to come back and beat Arizona at home. Uh, there, there are times when like people wonder, like Josh Allen, only to a different extent with Jimmy Garoppolo, when he's going to have the complete game, when he's going to just take the world by storm. But they are nine and one right now. The problem: Seattle is only eight and two behind them. Now Seattle is not that good, but Russell Wilson is. He is that good. So I mean, that's that to me is going to be that division is still up for grabs. I'm not buying. I'm not buying New Orleans anymore. I still think that Drew Brees after Thanksgiving. He starts to go downhill at this point in his Think career. So. And Green Bay has lost some head scratchers this year where you're sitting there going, wait, wait, what? You barely beat Carolina, and the week before that you lost it in L.A. to the Chargers in front of your own fans who made the trip to the game. So right now I think the NFC, while it's, I think it's better than the AFC, it's still up for grabs. It's still very much up for grabs right now. The 49ers yeah. are in the driver's seat, though. Number six, should the Panthers pump the brakes on releasing Cam Newton? <laughs> <laughs> Kyle Allen has not played well in three of his last four games. I think the NFL started to figure the guy out, and you still have your franchise quarterback on the roster. Yep. This is what you see all the time with sophomore slumps, right? Mm-hmm. This is the guys come out in one year, and they play very well the rookie year, maybe the s- second year of actually starting. And guys, the, you guys watch film. And the, the, they do nothing but watch film. So they find your ticks. They find what you can't do well, and they attack that, right? Mm-hmm. I think this is what's happening with Kyle Allen. They're figuring out. They look. They have enough film on this guy to say, "What can we do to uh, make the adjustments to put this guy behind the eight ball?" And they're doing that right now. There's a reason why he bounced around in college. He was at Houston, then he was at Texas Tech. He lost his job both places. Now the interesting thing, though, is that there are teams that are interested in Cam Newton right now. Maybe the team that owns his rights, the team that he plays for, it might be the team that say, "Hey, you know what, Cam." One more year. Now, he does have North Turner as his offensive coordinator, who was the quarterback whisperer. A year ago, we didn't know about his shoulder issue. Right. And this year, he had the other issue with his feet and everything else. So, I mean, maybe if he's fully healthy after a year of sitting on the shelf, maybe next year he could be the comeback player of the year with North Turner. So maybe Carolina needs to wait a little bit. Ten NFL questions. Number seven, can anyone fix Jameis Winston at this point? No. He is what he is. He's going to have games where you're going to be astounded, and he's going to have games where you're astounded the wrong way. <laughs> he's, he's just an inconsistent quarterback. And I th- you look at him coming out of college, and you thought that he was going to be the next big thing, and then he gets an NFL and shows that he's just what he is, an uh, inconsistent guy. Who Wild Stallion. stallion yeah. lots of t- Bruce Arians is the, supposed to be the quarterback whisperer. Well, yeah, but you, you can only do so much. R- well, that's my point, though. Could anyone fix him? No. I, I don't know. I, I don't think anyone can fix him. He is who he is at this point in time, and it's not like he's a, a rookie or second year, third year, where you can kind of mold him. All the mistakes he's made, all the bad habits he has made uh, and uh, picked up over the last th- four or five years, was he 2014 he was drafted, mm-hmm. they're – they're going to be with him. He, you're not fixing it. So you got to take the good with the bad with Jameis Winston. It's like kind of like Ryan Fitzpatrick. You're going to have mm-hmm. to take the good with the bad. Well, it's funny you mentioned Ryan Fitzpatrick. He was taken in 2015, I believe, because that was the year the Bills didn't have that first-round pick. Yes. And the, the big topic was would, would Chip Kelly trade up to get Mariota? Yeah, Chip Kelly. That's how long ago it was. Chip Kelly, would he trade up with Philadelphia to go get Marcus Mariota with the second overall pick? But the thing is, you mentioned Ryan Fitzpatrick. To me, Jameis Winston reminds me of a stronger-armed 
Ryan, Ryan Fitzpatrick, Fitzpatrick. Yep. where a guy was like, he had two minutes left. To the game. How's he going to throw an interception and lose this game? <laughs> and, he, and, and, he, and he typically would. Uh, Ten NFL questions. Number eight, have we seen the last of Colin Kaepernick in the National Football League? I think we addressed that in the last segment. Absolutely. I, I, I just don't see why anyone would pick him up at this point. They know what he can offer, but they know the media circus that would follow and swirl around him coming through. It's, a, it's the same exact reason no one's going to go after um, – uh, Tim Tebow, if, if he tried to make a comeback. They don't want to deal with the media circus, and he's not that good. If he was that good, he'd be in the NFL right now. When the Regardless, pa- when the pain, he's not that good. When the, when the pain and the frustration outweighs the talent, it's yeah. not going to be – it's not It's not going to work out. Number nine, are the Falcons saving Dan Quinn's job? They won two in a row. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, no, maybe. Three and, s- three and seven right now. They go and they beat <sighs> New Orleans last week. Then they take out Carolina. Who looks atrocious now again, but that's that's a story. They have a story now. They've yeah. won two in a row, two blowout wins in a row. Uh-huh. Their secondary is getting stronger. Mm-hmm. I gotta wonder. You look at this. They have a stable front office. Thomas Dimitrov and Scott Pioli work well together. They were in a Super Bowl only a few years ago. The one thing with them to me is that I think Matt Ryan. He's Joe Flacco's age. He's probably got another yeah. year or so left. And he had one great year, an MVP season. Yep. But for the most part, he's been uh, you know, not a B quarterback in the National yeah. Football League. Not somebody you call a fran- – he's a franchise quarterback, but he's like around the Matt Stafford category. Yeah, Maybe a little bit better than that. He went to a Super Bowl. But to me, it's like uh, if you want to keep stability in your organization, maybe they're one of those teams that draft a two or a quarterback next year in the first or second round, and he sits behind Matt Ryan and it comes out. I mean, you have, you have a stable front office. This has just been a bad year with injuries. Yeah, it's been a bad year, but it, it doesn't matter. You, three games, uh, three and seven, is for a team that expected to be in the a, a top of the, the um, South Division there. You got New Orleans kind of skidding right now, and then the Panthers without Cam Newton. So you, without Cam Newton, you were sitting here looking at this team, and you're like, yeah, I mean, this, this is going to be a team that can maybe sneak past New Orleans and win this division. But they've been – Pretty bad with injuries. But they have won two games in a row, blowout wins against two teams over 500, something the Bills haven't done all year. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, maybe Quint, maybe he can get it going with this team and save his job this year. That's he'd, he'd have to continue. he got six games mm-hmm. left. Yeah, yeah, you can't. I agree. You can't implode. Yeah, you can't implode. You get if you continue doing this, mm-hmm. maybe they look at you and say, we'll give you one more year or a half a year. Mm-hmm. But if, if you – Go 500 here. You're not. You're not going. Anywhere. And finally, ten qu- tenth question of ten NFL questions. Do you like the idea I see of 17 games, one neutral game, two buys, and two extra playoff teams? It sounds like the Bill Gray's uh, ad I just read. Uh, but the NFL is talking about adding a 17th game, a neutral site game. Maybe it's at South Bend. Maybe it's in Mexico City, like tonight's Monday Night Football game. Adding two extra playoff teams, one in each conference, meaning one buy for the best team in each conference, and an extra bye week. I mean, do you like that idea? I do. I mean, it's more football for me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's you know, only one more game. It's one, it's one more game, but it's more football. Two, more football is great. Taking out two preseason games and possibly adding a scrimmage at home that's free for fans. This is all talk right now. I mean, preseason is useless anyway. It's a waste. I of hate money. it. It's, it's a waste of. Um, we watch for it. Everybody, we watch <laughs> it. We gotta watch it because it's football. football right? you, know, you, you haven't had football since January, so you want to get into football. You're gonna watch it. You know, it's like going people going to training camp. It means nothing, mm-hmm. but we want to see football. So adding another game is more money for the NFL, more revenue. Why not? Let's do it. I want to do one thing where at the end of the season, the bottom 16 or the the, t- the top 16 teams in the NFL get to draft their opponent from the bottom 16 teams in the NFL mm. and host a game. But it looks like the NFL wants to make this game international. They know the London project's not going to work. Yeah, it's just it's just too it's just too much income to be lost by the players. The players' association never going to go with it. So I think this is a nice compromise. I really do. And if if it means more money for the players too, with the CBA and everything else, I, I'm all for it. I don't Absolutely. like increasing playoff teams, but at least more than half the teams are still out of the playoffs, which creates more urgency. And that's what makes the NFL awesome. Time for overtime rules. Uh, NASCAR season ended yesterday, and nobody knows that it even went on. New rule. NASCAR, you can't build a sport on your stars. Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s gone, all right? Tony Stewart's gone. Carl Edwards is gone. Jeff Gordon is gone. And Jimmy Johnson can't race anymore. And the guy who won your cup championship, uh, Kyle Kyle Busch, nobody likes. Nobody's paying attention to NASCAR. Quit screwing with the rules. You have to figure out another way to get people to watch your sport. And I hope that the NBA, Major League Baseball, and golf – in hockey, pay attention to this because their sto- their sports are built on star- stars too, and it's not working out. At least baseball, you don't know who the stars are. You know what they look like. But the NBA without LeBron could be a problem. At least LeBron is saving the NBA despite the fact that, well, this year a lot of stars are on the shelf this year yeah. or taking off games for load management. Another thing, uh, overtime rules. Colin Kaepernick, no more. You made your point, and your point was all about you. 
It's not about social justice. It's all about you. I'm yep. done. I don't want to hear from you again. Goodbye. Yeah. And uh, overtime rules. Uh, you want to be a woman in media, in sports media in particular? Give us your knowledge, not your assets. It's cheating. Okay. You want to be. <laughs> you want to be respected. Okay. Give me your writing. Give me your talent. Don't give me. Don't bat your eyes and give me your Instagram looks because it's not becoming of a journalist. It's just showing off that you. You want to be respected, but you also want it both ways, don't you? Do you I, I'm not touching it. All right. I'm not touch- we, we, we've been down that road before, and it, <laughs> it never ends well. And finally, overtime rules. Every time a college star gets injured, should not create a referendum on college athletes getting paid. This weekend, I watched a bunch of St. John Fisher College seniors. And last week, I watched a bunch of Brockport seniors take the field in their last home football games. None of them exp- – no, they don't even get scholarships. They play because they love the game. You want to pay the athletes and let them make money off their likenesses? That's cool, but – let me ask you a question. To a tag of a low. He got hurt this past weekend. Okay, where else is he going to be able to show off and showcase his skills? You can't find an alternative to college football. Guys are going to get hurt. It's going to happen. It's unfair and it stinks, but it still is football. We don't need a referendum every time a kid gets hurt in college football because we expect so much out of him. It's going to happen, and it's unfortunate, but accidents do happen. It is football. I think we need to pump the brakes on referendums or any changes we need to make to college athletics. I have no problems paying athletes. I really don't, but we don't need to, like, thumb our nose at the NCAA every time somebody gets hurt. I don't think that's fair. Okay. I don't like the NCAA either, but, I mean, come on. Until the XFL or some other league can prove they can pay athletes who aren't ready for the NFL, college football is where it's going to be for the foreseeable future. So enjoy it. So, for my co-host, Icy Vic, you want to come back next week? You're on yeah, vacation? I'm, I'm here. All right. So, Icy's going to join me next week. That'll be three. That'll be a three-peat. I'm Dan Burrell. You can join Icy tomorrow with Ryan Lacell on the Huddle Show at 5 o'clock right here in Rock Sports Network. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember, it's just a ride. It's just sports. It's just a ride. Enjoy the ride. So, for our executive producer, Gary Sadak, I'm Dan Burrell. This is Icy Vic. We will see you, God willing, next Monday right here in overtime on the Rock Sports Network. RockSportsNetwork.com.